Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a bank manager and a customer about a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Thanks for coming in to see us about opening an account. I'm Tom Marsh. I'm the manager here at this branch of UKB Bank. Lisa Ashbury. Nice to meet you. Please take a seat. So, I understand you're interested in opening an account with us. Yes, I want to open a savings account, but today I'd like to find out more about opening a current account. Can you give me some details about it? Of course. Well, there are no charges for using this type of account with us, like there are with some other banks. In fact, we reward you with a type of bonus at the end of each month. We credit your account with £5 if you've made more than 10 transactions in the previous month. Great, but tell me, how good are you at getting in touch with customers? My current bank are not very good at communicating if there's a problem. No message, no call, no letter. I see. We work in a slightly different way here at UKB. Any issues we see on the account, and we send you a text message to your phone to advise you. In addition, we immediately send out a letter with this information, too. That sounds great. I know your customer service center won an award last year for excellent service. I'm afraid I can't say the same for my existing bank. They take at least 20 minutes to even answer your call. At our center, our policy is to pick up the phone within two minutes. If this isn't possible due to high demand, we'll ring you back at a suitable time. Sounds promising. So, what do you need from me to open the account? Let's start with some personal details, and then we'll get you an account number and card set up. By the way, is there a charge to have a debit card for the account? My current bank charges around £15 a year. No, maybe it's £20. Yes, I'm sure it is. We used to charge £10 per year, but now there's no charge, and the checkbook is free of charge if you need one. Great, let's open the account then. OK. First name is Lisa, L-I-S-A, correct? That's right. And the surname is Ashbury. Can you just confirm the spelling of that for me? Sure. It's A-S-H-B-E-R-R-Y, Mrs. Great. And your address, please? 20 Pricely Lane, GT5 9HS. Is that Pricely with an S? A C. And the postcode is GT59H for hotel, F for Freddy? S, uh, no, it's S for sugar. Okay, I've got that. Now let's set up your bank account. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, initially, we set you up with a debit card, a checkbook if required, and you also have the option of a second debit card for a family member if you need one. Ah, and we send you a card reader 
looks a bit like a calculator, which is where you type in your PIN code when you need to access internet banking. Will you be setting up an internet banking account? Definitely. I do all of my banking online, so I'll need that. But I never write checks. Can't remember the last time I wrote one. So no need to send the book, thank you. And the additional card? My husband has his own account here with a debit card. In fact, we've thought about making it a joint account, but in the end we decided it was easier to do it this way. So no, I don't need that either. Just one question. How do I get my PIN number and account number? The account number, you'll get that today before you leave, but we'll send an email to confirm everything. The PIN number will arrive by post within the next couple of days, along with your debit card. As for the card reader, that must be picked up in branch, so we'll give you a call when it arrives. Great. While I'm here, can I take a leaflet about your savings accounts? Of course. There are three different types of accounts. If you have under £5,000 to save, our bronze account is the best. The silver option is for amounts above this and up to £10,000. And the gold, well, that's for sums over £10,000. But you have to invest for at least three years. Well, it depends what we decide. But I imagine we'll be putting around £7,000 into it if we decide to go ahead. So I'll take this leaflet. OK. Any questions before we create the account number? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a guide talking to a group of tourists at a train station. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the magnificent and historic central train station here in Porto Nuevo, Spain. While you wait for your train to Seville, I'll be telling you a little about the construction and history of the station you're standing in. I'll also be giving you an overview of the facilities and services on offer here, as well as where to find them. Puerto Nuevo's first railway station was built in 1851. The country's first rail line had been opened only three years earlier, so trains were relatively new to Spain at that point. The original station in the centre was mostly destroyed in a fire, and it was completely rebuilt and reopened in 1892, and this is the building we see today. The design for the building was created by Alberto Palacio a highly respected Spanish architect. Palacio used a colourful red stone for the outside, supported by a structure made of iron. The station is made up of two main buildings, connected by an impressive iron and glass roof that covers the platform area and allows natural sunlight to reach the station floor. In 1985, work began to extend the station, adding more platforms and expanding the waiting areas. This was partly in preparation for the high-speed trains, which were introduced in 1992. This service now operates between most major Spanish cities and has drastically reduced the time of journeys between Puerto Nuevo and Barcelona, for example. At present, the station serves as a transport hub for tens of thousands of commuters every day, operating underground trains, local commuter services, and cross-country trains. Annually, 
the station sees around 40 million people getting on its trains, of which about 10 million are foreign tourists. As you can imagine, operating such a busy central station is quite a challenge, but the station has a well-organized staff and high-end facilities. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at the questions 15 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 15 to 20. As I have mentioned, the design and layout of the central station has changed drastically over the years. Let's take a look at the floor plan and note some of the new features that you can see while you're here. As you can see, it is quite a large station with a number of different areas. Visitors enter the station through the grand entrance at the front of the building. Travellers in need of assistance can head straight for the tourist information desk, which can be found immediately on the right. They speak most international languages here, so you don't have to worry if you're not great at Spanish. You may also need to use the bathroom before you travel. The toilets are located on the other side of the station in the corner, just by the entrance. Upon leaving the toilets, you'll find the cafe to your left, where you can get a drink and some snacks for your journey. And just past that is the souvenir shop, offering a range of gifts, clothes and postcards of the city of Puerto Nuevo. If you need a ticket to travel, you can buy these from the ticket machines, or you can go to the ticket office near the ticket barriers. The staff are very friendly and speak English, French and Spanish. You can pay by cash or card. Access to the shopping area is up the stairs behind the ticket office. Once you have your ticket, Head through the ticket barriers to the two platforms. The first and closest platform is for trains going south of the city. It's worth walking down the platform just to see the marble statue of Queen Isabella I of Spain. The far platform is less impressive, with only a vending machine at the end selling cold drinks for thirsty commuters. If you walk back from the statue on platform one, you'll come to two large offices. The first one in front of you is the place to go if you lose your bag or leave it on the train. The sign says Lost Property Office in English as well as Spanish. Although we can't guarantee you'll recover everything, the staff are pretty good at finding your missing possessions. Next door to this room, you'll find a number of people in uniform whose job is to keep the station safe. This is the security office, and it's where you should go if you have anything stolen, although this is very rare. Over the last year, only 20 items have been reported stolen by travellers. We're sure you'll have a safe and enjoyable experience in the Puerto Nuevo Central Station. Now, if you look over here, we have a map of the shopping area attached to the station. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear a discussion between three managers about a product launch. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning, Ruth. Morning, Sally. Hi, Jim. Morning. OK, are we ready to make a start then? Sure. So, it's very exciting. Our new product, Motivate Me, is ready to go to the product launch phase. It's coming out at the end of November to make the most of the Christmas and New Year shoppers in December. And we need to decide the details of that. Ruth, can you give us an overview of the product to start? Sure. Motivate Me is a smartwatch, as you know. It's got several main features in common with other similar brands. Pedometer, GPS, tracking sleep patterns, all the usual points. However, what our innovative design does, which most other products on the market don't, is offer a fully waterproof feature. Sounds great, but I have to say I've seen other products with that feature too. You're absolutely right, Jim. What makes ours unique is even the standard model can be completely submerged for extended periods of time. Our product design is solid, though many faults have been reported in our competitors, to be honest, meaning their watches weren't durable. Also, not all models benefited from this feature, so there were many occasions when the device would let customers down. Let's imagine you went running and got caught in a heavy downpour. The device could simply stop working with that level of rain. So we would be looking at pitching it towards not gentle day-to-day -day activity like walking or jogging, but more towards extreme sports, diving, surfing, winter sports, marathon runners, triathletes, mountain bikers, sports in which you'd expect to get wet and dirty. I know it was designed with this type of sport in mind. Indeed, and of course the other special feature of Motivate Me is its hard-wearing design and seven-day battery life. Ruth's right, and I've been actively involved in that. There really is nothing quite like it on the market at the moment, though our competitors won't take long in bringing out rival products, I suppose. Exactly, which makes it even more important that we do this launch well and get a real edge in the market before that happens. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, let's think about exactly which means of communication we should be employing to get this off the ground. TV advertising is obviously the most costly, but at the same time, probably one of the most widely used forms of media where we could get the most exposure, although social media is starting to take over in terms of effectiveness these days. We'd have to consider costs, both of the airtime itself and how we'd make the advertisement. I mean, do we get a famous sports person to endorse it for us and make the ads? Why not simply get an endorsement from a well-known sports person, but not necessarily on TV? There might be a saving in that. We could contract someone professional to wear a Motivate Me when competing. I really like that idea, Ruth, though I'm not sure it'd be cheaper. If we want someone really famous, we'd be looking at a significant sum to get them to do this for us at real events. Couldn't we get local events organisers to do that for us? They could get participants or teams wearing our device in different cities during sports competitions without having to pay out huge sums for a Rafa Nadal or a Leo Messi, for example. That could really work. Great idea, Jim. Yes, I definitely support investigating that possibility further. Ruth? Definitely. Good thinking, Jim. As for shooting an advert for TV, we should consider doing that without an endorsement, I think. Though maybe we could look at contracting it out to a media company. Let's move on to social networking for now. 
Jim mentioned it before. Could we arrange to do it in-house? Maybe we could pay a digital marketing company to manage that for us. It's something that seems so easy to do, but it's not simple to do effectively, believe me. Well, maybe we do need to outsource that work then. We used a company a couple of years ago for something similar. I could get a quote and some ideas from them. I agree with that, Ruth. Me too. Now, what about magazine advertising? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear part of a lecture on features of urban design. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everybody. As this urban design course is now nearing its end, we turn our attention away from the big picture, city planning, vast infrastructure projects, etc., and onto the smaller but by no means less important details. Over the next four lectures, we will be looking at the development of what has become known as street furniture. Now, you may not recall passing any sofas or standard lamps on the way to the lecture hall, but I assure you that furniture definitely does exist outdoors as well as in. In streets, parks and other public spaces, you can find an array of items from Benches to bollards to bus stops, taxi stands to traffic lights to telephone boxes. That would be grouped under this loose label. If you are now thinking, fair enough, but what's there to study? Isn't it just a case of ordering ten bins and a few benches for this new park on Broad Street? For most of the 20th century, you would have held the popular opinion. It wasn't until the end of that century that the term street furniture came into existence. Street objects were a detail, a background accessory to which urban planners paid little attention. Most work on their implementation was delegated to subcontractors or technical teams who made their decisions based on purely functional and economic priorities. However, in recent years, it has become increasingly important to think carefully about the implications of certain decisions related to the selection of items of street furniture. These take into account a number of factors including aesthetics, cultural identity and uniformity, the environment, uh, pedestrian mobility and road safety as well as the logical and spatial relationship of one item, for example, a bench, to another, a, a bin. More and more, what are called humanist concerns are becoming key. That is, how each item helps we humans interact with the surrounding environment. Now, let's have a look in more detail at these factors in relation to a specific item of street furniture, which is ubiquitous, yet relatively ignored. The bollard. If you're not familiar with bollards, they are short posts or poles which you might nowadays see used to stop vehicles driving into certain areas, pedestrian streets for example. They are an excellent example of an item of street furniture that has adapted to a range of functions, materials and the appearances over its long history. 
They began life as posts to secure boats and ships and were originally made of wood. In fact, the related word bowl means tree trunk. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British felt the need for something a bit grander for the purpose, so made good use of the hundreds of cannons they had recently seized from the defeated French fleet and eventually incorporated the cannon into official street furniture design. Now, the first example of a bollard being used to protect a construction from vehicle damage actually comes from a little earlier, the 1740s, and can be seen in the background of a painting by Canaletto. However, it's not until the invention of the motor vehicle, some 200 years later, that they became widely used in this role. Made of tough concrete and arranged carefully to limit vehicle access, their function was a strictly practical one. In more recent years, the design of bollards has moved beyond the purely utilitarian. There is a good example of this in the city centre of Norwich, England, where an artist's design of a bollard was central to a regeneration project intended to reflect the city's rich cultural history. He chose a simple design, combining sculpted medieval heads, or finials, with madder red poles. Norwich was once famed for the manufacture of cloth of this colour, and so this choice is a celebration of that fact. Let's now have a look at the simple yet effective design of a modern bollard. You can see on your handout a design for a rising or retractable bollard, which can prevent or permit access to areas as desired, such as when holding a parade. The idea is fairly simple. The bollard, which is made of heavy gauge materials, stands at 1.2 metres in its raised position, above a foundation case of 1.5 metres depth. The state of the bollard, whether up or down, can be altered when necessary by actuating a hydraulic system through the pushing of a button on the access panel. This controls the process, which acts through a conduit running just beneath the roadway. When the button is pushed, the bollard retracts into the galvanised casing below. Well, now, let's move on to look at another fascinating example of street furniture design, the humble bin. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.